The Magic Puddin, written and illustrated by Norman Lindsay, who is one of Australia's premier artists. He mainly painted adult sort of th themes, but he wrote this book. And as you can see, just how much we've used it. And I read this as a little boy. Well, my parents read it to me and I read it to my kids. And now I'm reading it to my grandchildren. The Magic Puddin' being the adventures of Bunyip Bluegum and his friends Bill Barnacle and Sam Sonoff. So this is a front way view of Bunyip Bluegum and his uncle Wattlebury. And at a glance you can see what a fine round splendid fellow Bunyip Bluegum is without me having to tell you. At a second glance you can see that uncle Wattlebury is more square than round and his face has whiskers on it. Looked at sideways you can still see what a splendid fellow Bunyip is though you can only see one side of his uncle's whiskers. Observed from behind however you completely lose sight of the whiskers and so fail to realize how immensely important they are. In fact these very whiskers were the chief cause for Bunyip leaving home to see the world for as he often said to himself Whiskers alone are bad enough, attached to faces coarse and rough. But how much greater their offence is when stuck on uncle's countenances. The plain truth was that Bunyip and his uncle lived in a small house in a tree and there was no room for the whiskers. What was worse, the whiskers were red and they blew about in the wind and Uncle Waterby would insist on bringing them to the dinner table where they got in the soup. Bunyip Bluegum was a tidy bear and he objected to whiskery soup. So he was forced to eat his meals outside, which was awkward. And besides, lizards came and borrowed his soup. His uncle refused to listen to reason on the subject of his whiskers. It was quite useless to give him hints such as presents of razors and scissors and boxes of matches to burn them off. On such occasions he would remark, Shaving may add an air that's somewhat brisker, for dignity commend me to the whisker. Or when more deeply moved he would exclaim, As noble thoughts the inward being grace, so noble whiskers dignify the face. Prayers and entreaties to remove the whiskers being of no avail, Bunyip decided to leave home without much more ado. The trouble was that he couldn't make up his mind whether to be a traveller or a swagman. You can't go about the world being nothing, but if you're a traveller, you have to carry a bag. And if you are a swagman, you have to carry a swag. And the question is, which is the heavier? At length, he decided to put the matter before Egbert Rumpus Bumpus the poet and ask his advice. And he found Egbert busy writing poems on a slate. He was so busy that he only had time to sing out, Don't interrupt the poet, friend, until his poem's at an end. And he went on writing harder than ever. And he wrote down all one side of the slate and all up the other, and then remarked, As there's no time to finish that, the time has come to have our chat. Be quick, my friend, your business state, before I take another slate. The fact is, said Bunyip, I've decided to see the world and I cannot make up my mind whether to be a traveller or a swagman. Which would you advise? And then the poet said, As you have no bags, it's plain to see, a traveller you cannot be. And as a swag you haven't either, you cannot be a swagman neither. For travellers must carry bags and swagmen have to hump their swags, like bottlers or ragmen. And as you have neither swag nor bag, you must remain a simple wag, nor swag or bagman. Dear me, said Bunyip Bluegum, I never thought of that. What must I do in order to see the world without carrying swags or bags? And the poet thought deeply and put on his eyeglasses and said impressively, Take my advice, don't carry bags, for bags are just as bad as bag as swags. They never, they're never made to measure. To see the world, your simple trick 
is but to take a walking stick, assume an air of pleasure, and tell the people near and far you stroll about because you are a gentleman of leisure. You've solved the problem, said Bunyip Bluegum, and wringing his friend's hand, he ran straight home and took his uncle's walking stick and, assuming an air of pleasure, set off to see the world. He, he found a great many things to see, such as dandelions and ants and traction engines and bolting horses and furniture being removed, besides being kept busy raising his hat and passing the time of day with people on the road, for he was a very well-bred young fellow, polite in his manner, graceful in his attitudes, and able to converse on a great variety of subjects, having read all the best Australian poets. Unfortunately, in the hurry of leaving home, he forgot to provide himself with food, and at lunchtime found himself attacked by pangs of hunger. Dear me, he said, I feel quite faint. I had no idea that one's stomach was so important. I have everything I require except food. But without food, everything is less than nothing. I've got a stick to walk with. I've got a mind to think with. I've got a voice to talk with. I've got an eye to wink with. I've lots of teeth to eat with. A brand new hat to bow with. A pair of fists to beat with. A rage to have a row with. No joy it brings to have indeed a lot of things one does not need. Observe my doleful plight, for here I am without a crumb to satisfy a raging tum. Oh, what an oversight. As he was indulging in these melancholy reflections, he came around a bend in the road and discovered two people in the very act of having lunch. These people were none other than Bill Barnacle, the sailor, and his friend, Sam Sornoff, the penguin bold. Bill was a small man with a large hat and a beard half as large as his hat and feet half as large as his beard. Sam Sornoff's feet were sitting down and his body was standing up because his feet were so short and his body so long that he had to do both together. They had a pudding in a basin and the smell that arose from it was so delightful that Bunya Bluegum was quite unable to pass on. Pardon me, he said, raising his hat, but am I right in supposing that this is a steak and kidney pudding? At present it is, said Bill Barnacle. It smells delightful, said Bunya Bluegum. It is delightful, said Bill, eating a large mouthful. Bunyip Bluegum was too much of a gentleman to invite himself to lunch, but he said carelessly, Am I right in supposing that there are onions in this pudding? And before Bill could reply, a thick angry voice came out of the pudding saying, Onions, bunions, corns and crabs, whiskers, wheels and handsome cabs, beer and bottles, beer and bones, give him a feed and end his groans. Albert, Albert, said Bill to the Puddin, where's your manners? Where's yours, said the Puddin rudely, guzzling away there and never so much as offering this stranger a slice. There you are, said Bill. There's nothing this Puddin enjoys more than offering slices of himself to strangers. How very polite of him, said Bunyip, but the Puddin replied loudly, Politeness be sugared, politeness be hanged. Politeness be jumbled, dumbled, and banged. It's simply a matter of putting on pace. Politeness has nothing to do with the case. Always anxious to be eaten, eaten said Bill. That's this Puddin's manner. Well, to oblige him, I ask you to join us at lunch. Delighted, I'm sure, said Bunyip, seating himself. There's nothing I enjoy more than a good go up in a steak and kidney pudding in the open air. Well said, remarked Sam Sornoff, patting him on the back. Hearty eaters are always welcome. You'll enjoy this pudding, said Bill, handing him a large slice. This is a very rare pudding. It's a cut and come again pudding, said Sam. It's a Christmas steak and apple dumpling pudding, said Bill. It's a... 
Shall I tell him? He asked, looking at Bill. And Bill nodded. And the penguin leant across to Bunyip Bluegum and said in a low voice, It's a magic puddin. No whispering, shouted the puddin angrily. Speak up. Don't strain a puddin's ears at the meal table. No harm intended, said Sam. I was merely remarking how well the crops are looking. Call him Albert when addressing me, added to Bunyip Bluegum. It soothes him. I'm delighted to make your acquaintance, Albert, said Bunyip. No soft soap from total strangers, said the puddin rudely. Don't take no notice of him, mate, said Bill. That's only his rough and ready way. What this pudding requires is politeness and constant eating. They had a delightful meal, eating as much as possible, for whenever they stopped eating, the pudding sang out, Eat away, chew away, munch and bolt and guzzle. Never leave the table till you're full up to the muzzle. But at length they had to stop. And in spite of these encouraging remarks, and as they refused to eat any more, the pudding got out of his basin, remarking, if you won't eat any more, he's giving you a run for the sake of exercise. And he set off so swiftly on a pair of extremely thin legs that Bill had to run like an antelope to catch him up. My word, said Bill, when the pudding was brought back. You have to be as smart as paint to keep this pudding in order. He's that artful, lawyers couldn't manage him. Put your hat on, Albert, like a little gentleman, he added placing the basin on his head. He took the puddin's hand, and Sam took the other, and they all set off along the road. The peculiar thing about the pudding was that though they had all had a great many slices of him, there was no sign of the place where the slices had been cut. Here's where the magic comes in, explained Bill. The more you eats, the more you gets. Cut and come again in his name, and cut and come again is his nature. Me and Sam have been eating away at this pudding for years, and there's not a mark on him. Perhaps, he added, you would like to hear how he came to own this remarkable pudding. Nothing would please me more, said Bunyip Bluegum. Well, in that case, said Bill, let's go for a song. Next time, we'll start with the song of how they found the magic pudding. <laughs>